thank you all for joining us. We're looking for a very uh, eye-opening and enlightening conversation. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over the conversation over to uh, Noelle Payne, who is a member of the Ohio University Southern Council on Diversity and Inclusion, and she'll be monitoring, uh, moderating this afternoon's uh, conversation. Noelle. Thanks, Robert. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. So first of all, I would just like to, to thank you all as well for being here. We really appreci appreciate it. Um, your input is very valuable. Um, but first of all, we'd like for you all to introduce yourself and just to let us know how you're doing. As right now is a hard time with the, the coronavirus and Black Lives Matters and just feeling such a division within our country. So how are you all doing? I'll start with Katrina. You're muted, babe. Okay, there we go. Um, gosh, you know, you, it has been a trying time. Um, I think the only thing that got me through this is really my faith and um, how grounded I am spiritually. Um, it's been intense here in my household because, of course, we see things through two different sets of eyes. And to be able to um, maintain a marriage through all of everything that's going on, it was just like overload of, you know, being stuck in the house um, on top of everything that was going on in the political realm. Um, it's been challenging, but I think um, going through it, it's really made you step into a different light and a different strength and um, make you face some things that maybe you have hid in the corner. Right. Paul, how about you? I'm doing fine. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm best known as Dr. McKenzie's husband. So, uh, yeah, we're doing fine. Um, you know, it's been kind of rough with the COVID, with all the adapting you have to do. But one good thing came out of it is that, uh, you know, uh, our children are pretty much growing up and moving away and doing their thing. And because of COVID, it's kind of brought us back together. So it's been nice for me and Teresa to have, you know, kids back in the house. We're doing a lot of family things, so that's been good. I'm a public school uh, administrator, and that's not been good. So <laughs> otherwise, doing okay. Good. Mashana? Hi, I'm Mashana Hamilton. Um, I am nursing faculty here at um, OU Southern. I am... <laughs> I am everywhere on the gamut. I am tired, I am sad, but I am hopeful that things are looking, are going to look upward. Um, it's been an exhausting year for a lot of reasons and I'm ready for some good things to happen and I'm hoping that we're headed in that direction. All right, thank you. So let's get started with our next question. What does being Black adjacent mean to you? And how are you connected to the Black community? Mashana, I'd like to go back with you first. Okay. Um, being Black adjacent, um, I have several Black family members. I have three nephews who are, I argue with my sister over whether they actually belong to me or her. Um, so I'm very close with them. And then on my husband's side, I have several other black family members. So um, black adjacent to me is not only having family, but also um, friends and um, being an advocate for equality um, for people of all colors. Um, so being close to the black community, but not being in the black community, but trying to have some empathy and see things from their perspective. Absolutely. Paul, how about you? Well, I had to have my daughter explain to me what that meant, uh, black adjacent. It's, you know, you're getting old when your kids have to <laughs> interpret, explain things to you all the time. Uh, but. Um, uh, black adjacent to me is uh, the way I understand it is uh, to me it feels like more of it's uh, I hate to make sure I try to say this correctly more of an outsider's term um, you know I'm married to a black woman 
I have biracial children and I have black family members. So in a way, I don't feel black adjacent. I just feel like, you know, my family is my family, but I do understand how it, um, it describes, you know, uh, the issues and the good things and the, the hard things that come with uh, being Afri African-American in this country. Uh, I'm, I'm glad somebody came up with a term for it because I think before there wasn't, you know, we just, people didn't know what to call it. Yeah, I can relate to you saying that um, you feel like an outsider or you're using the outsider term because my mother is white and my dad is black. My mother used to always say that, you know, that she felt that way. So I really appreciate that you bringing that up. Um, Katrina? Um, I am married to an African-American male. So and I have um, four biracial children. Um, I'm like Paul, didn't know that um, that word even existed. Um, but I, too, am thankful that there's maybe a term. I don't I think I kind of balance it out. Are we being placed in yet another group? And so there's another group that we've got to understand. And, you know, so it kind of I kind of balance it out. Um, I too, like Paul, um, I feel like we were kind of left out of the equation that America sees it either black or white. There's no gray area. And so um, we kind of get tossed in the corner somewhere. And there's part of me that, man, I get grouped into racism, even though I'm married to a black man, but people see my color as being white. Um, so I like having the term, I guess, maybe that gives us a voice to where, where maybe we can speak up and, you know, share our feelings and understanding since we are um, kind of ingrained into both cultures. I'm gonna go with that thought, Katrina, that you have. The next question is, how do you feel gives you a unique perspective? So I kind of want you to elaborate on that since you've already hit it. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I always tell people, if you're married to, if you're African-American and you're married to an African-American, you do not understand my culture, no way, shape or form. You can pretend that you do because my culture is probably the majority of the United States, but you don't understand, you know, what we're taught. You don't understand, you know, things that is important to the way we were raised. If you're, um, if you're white, married to a white person, you cannot understand the African-American culture. No way, shape, or form. It takes getting intimate, and that's not sexual. It takes getting intimate with somebody else and being able to break down those barriers. Because when we go to work, we put up these barriers and we never enter in past that barrier. So we got to understand the sensitive side of things. And if, um, if we never take that time to get into anybody else's culture, then we're always over here demanding people to understand our side. And we never open up our eyes to understand anybody else's. That's perfect, Mishana. Um. I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was so caught up in her answer. <laughs> the question was, what, um, how does it give us a unique perspective? Correct. How do you feel that it gives you a unique perspective? Um, I think, you know, I think until you have someone that you, you love and you fear when they leave the house, you don't understand the danger just someone's skin color can put them in. Um, and, you know, I used to, um, I, I feel guilty for this, but I used to say, I don't see color, I don't see color. And I finally learned that how um, disrespectful that is and, and how 
embracing color and seeing the, you know, seeing what makes each of us unique is so important. And I see, I think that being black adjacent has opened my eyes to that more. And I'm so aware now that, um, you know, I think I use the terminology, I don't see color because I loved everybody, but um, that was in its own, seeing it through, I don't know if this is making any sense, but being a part of um, raising black children and seeing things through their perspective, how important it is to see the, the color and to recognize the color and to recognize um, the unique attributes that the color and the heritage brings to their life, I think is, is important. So I don't know that I would have, I don't know that it would have ever clicked with me in the way that it has having close family members. Um, so I think, you know, again, I don't know that I would have understood, I hope that I would have, but I don't know that I would have understood, you know, just the danger that people of color are in if I didn't, if I wasn't, if I didn't love people that were, that I worry about on a day-to-day -day basis, just living their lives, just, you know, making normal routine, um, you know, just, just being out in public and being, being dark puts them at danger in danger. And I think that's a perspective that I have because I love them so dearly. And I don't know that I would have developed that without that. Again, I hope I would have, but I don't know. No, I, I like your perspective and I like how you, how you address the issue of uh, how you say you don't see color. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, I would always say, you know, my friends would say it to me or my friend's parents and I, I myself got lumped into that, you know. Mm -hmm. So as an adult, as I get older and as I'm on this committee, <laughs> I've learned a lot about myself and um, in my background and I finally realized you don't see me unless mm -hmm. you see my mm -hmm. color. Exactly, yes. Even that's a fine line because I'm between the two so I have mm -hmm. to straddle constantly but I appreciate you bringing that up um Paul uh I just agree with what Katrina, uh, Katrina said about uh intimacy uh you know when you have that relationship sometimes you can feel what you know like if, if my wife is in a certain if she's if she's somewhere and she experiences something I, I can feel it and whereas you know before I might have noticed it but Noticing something and feeling it is different, uh, you know, whether it's a slight or a compliment, you know, it just gives you an idea of, uh, uh, I guess, just the obstacle. The main thing is just uh, obstacles that are there for a person of color that I wasn't aware of before I got married. Uh, I thought I knew. I had black friends, you know, I had, had that kind of relationship, but uh, it's an eye opener when you love somebody and you know, you share what happens to them and it's, it makes it personal. Absolutely. So. And I think that's what I was trying to get across. So he's, he's right on line with what I was saying. If you're, because he is intimate with Teresa, he's able to understand what she's going through. If he wasn't intimate with Teresa, again, it would just be, you know, he's only seeing one side of it. Right. And you're saying intimacy doesn't have to be a spouse relationship, but it could be friendship. Yeah. It could be another type of relationship yes. where you're just closely connected is what you mean. Absolutely. But I want to add something um, that my wonderful husband just said. But um, I think also because you guys are Black adjacent, and this really is a new term, um, I think you also experience some of the same things. For example, we moved to North Carolina and my husband had never experienced someone who hated him just because of who he was. And he did experience that there. And it was hard for him to wrap his mind around someone hating him just because he was white and educated and was a threat to them, their perceived threat. He wasn't actually a threat to them, but that was their perception. So I think you guys might get some blow blowback just because you are connected to the black community in the ways that you are. I agree with that, Teresa. I, um, when I ran for office, that scared people. Um, I had friends that would be at a restaurant and they would overhear people talking and say, oh my goodness, now our town is going to go to um, 
all this violence and they were scared that I was in office and that um, I guess they were afraid of black people and afraid of the decisions that I was going to make and um, all of a sudden give black people an upper hand. Um, and so that was an issue when I ran the second time and people would say, no, nope, I'm not voting for that. You know, I can remember when I was in second grade. I mean, this has always stuck with me. Um, and I didn't even understand what in the world she was talking about. But it was during the election where Jesse Jackson was um, running for president. And I was at a friend's house. And I don't know. I mean, the, the election got brought up. And I remember her saying, my mom said, if Jesse Jackson is elected president, he'll make all the white people slaves. And wow. at that point, I mean, even in the second grade, I'm like, she's crazy. I, what is she talking about? But it's, it's interesting how bizarre people's thought patterns are. And, you know, I, I wish that things had changed since then. I'm not sure, so sure that we're, we've come that far as, as a nation, but um, I, that has always stuck with me that, in, you know, in my little naive second grade mind, I even recognized how crazy that was. But if that one person thought it, then it, you know, it's prob probable that many, many more did. Yeah, absolutely. I do remember um, my parents talking about that to me. Um, and actually the same phrase was used by my mother's side. So the white side. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just a snippet of, <laughs> of, you know, being young and being told that how reality just really hits you in the face at times. Mm -hmm. And you have no control over it and you can't change any, anybody's mind unless they want to change their minds themselves. Right. So that was hard. One of the, one of the hard ones. Um, so we, you kind of, we kind of touch on this, but I really want to get on your experiences of you all have been immersed in the black culture. So can you talk about some of the hurdles that you have faced due to this immersion? Um, Paul, can we start with you? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, my wife has a huge family. She has a million cousins, aunts, <laughs> uncles, like this huge extended family. And I don't have that. I have basically my, my, when I, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, um, you know, with any, um, uh, I remember when I first, uh, Teresa brought me home to meet her grandmother, um, uh, I just, you know how it is when you're around some people, you just get a vibe, uh, where it's, uh, maybe they, they don't appreciate you being there or something like that. You know, you know, I think everybody has that. It's not, you'll find you have that in society. You can have that in families, uh, especially when there's so many people in somebody's family. Um, so that, that was, uh, that's my experience for the first time. I never felt, uh, uh I mean, by and large, if we've been with my wife's family, I was welcomed in with open arms, and that was fantastic. But the few who, you know, didn't appreciate me, uh, I definitely felt that kind of feeling, and I never had that before. Um, and I think it was uh, maybe just because I was white. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but that's just the feeling I got. So, you know, I never had, to, I never felt that before, and I think that's something maybe, you know, uh, people of color feel uh, pretty often. Yeah, I've heard that um, black men will say, or even black women will say, you're taking their queen. So you have to deal with that sign. You're like, no, I'm just taking Teresa. <laughs> you know? uh, I'm just taking the person. So um, I witnessed that myself. So your, your feelings are hopefully validated, I hope, um, by me saying that. Um, how about Mashana? Um. I think some of the, the biggest hurdle that I have faced is just being so ashamed, ashamed of white America, um, ashamed of being white, you know, feeling guilty for not, and not knowing really um, how to, 
not knowing how to make right all the wrongs that are happening every day um, for, you know, people of color that I think, you know, if it would be so easy to, to be so bitter and to have such a hard heart towards white America and, and rightfully so. Um, so I think that that's one of my biggest hurdles is being ashamed and embarrassed and just feeling, you know, especially in the past few years, just feeling sort of helpless in, in changing the overall tone of, of the climate in the United States, I think. Or, or those around you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm not talking, right. I'm not talking about, you know, things that are happening in other places. I'm talking about the ignorance every day that I see the, the stupid things that people say to me and think that I'm going to agree with them. And they know that I love black people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it just is bewildering to me. Bewildering. Katrina, you want to add? Um, I understand what Mashana is saying. I can remember being young um, and being in church and listening to a song that said, Jesus loves all the children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. And immediately I said, well, then why do we hate black people? Mm -hmm. And that affected me early in life. And so um, I, I came into the black community probably around age 17. So it's been a long time. Um, and I can remember just being ashamed that the human race actually thought that was okay. Mm -hmm. And it took me many years because I was ashamed of being white and that my ancestors thought this way. And it just really bothered me. But then I had come to the realization that, you know, God made me white for a reason. And so I had to embrace that. And once I become confident in who I was, then I, I just felt like God was using me to be able to bridge a gap, to bring understanding. Um, I always find myself when I'm with my white family trying to explain and help them understand how my black family feels. And then when I'm with my black family, I'm always trying to make them understand how my white family feels. So um, it has, it's been challenging, um, but um, we love each other. And um, we, like all families, we may not disagree, we may not agree with everything, but love conquers all in the end for us. Absolutely. Let's take a minute, uh, Teresa, you want to check the chat to see how many questions we have? We don't have any questions in the chat. We just have a couple of comments. Um, one person, Barb, said really interesting point, Dr. McKenzie. And then uh, Maya McKenzie, my daughter, our daughter, she said that's still when her dad was speaking. And um, we did have one question um, with this um, registration. That person asked, how do you respond to ignorance when someone discriminates? Anybody want to start that one off? If you start, ignorance is going to be ignorance. It doesn't matter if it's color, if it's um, gender, if it's whatever. Ignorance is ignorance. Ignorance is unlearned. If you walk around with a chip on your shoulder and ready to launch because somebody said something that was quote, ignorant, um, you have to be willing to um, be willing to teach. And my daughter always tells me, mom, is this another teachable moment? <laughs> <laughs> and so I have to live, I feel like I have to live my life like that 24 seven, that I have to be in teach mode. Um, so that I can maybe change somebody's mindset. You gotta remember people were taught a certain way their whole life. Mm -hmm. I can remember going to Alabama and my 
my father-in-law's dad, we went to meet him. And he's, you know, at that time was probably 70, 80 years old. So he's from the deep South. So when this white woman walks into his home, he jumps and screams. And so could I have been offended? Absolutely. But I got a taste of what my husband may have been through his whole life. And so it's a matter of operating without that spirit of offense. And if you can take that ignorance and make it a teachable moment, maybe you just change somebody's attitude. Absolutely. Mashana or Paul, you want either one of you want to add to that question? Um, I would just say I've always used the know your audience you know, philosophy or like the uh, Bible says, don't cast your pearls before swine. You know, I'm not going to get into it with somebody who obviously wants to argue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather drop and plant a seed and let it go and just, you know, challenge it. Don't, you know, if somebody's being ignorant or saying something that's, you know, provocative, you know, you know challenge it. But uh, I'm not going to argue with them. But that, that's what, what they want. I mean, I just always uh, let them know where I, how I feel about it and just, uh, you know, move on. It's hard to keep those emotions from getting heightened in that situation. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's what I was just thinking last night. I was going through these questions and I was um, speaking with my, talking with my husband and I said, you know, I'm probably not a very good person to even speak on this panel because I have this rage inside of me that I just feel like I'm on the verge of explosion a lot of the time. Um, and I try, I'm trying really hard to stay positive and to not be baited by stupidity. And I mean, the things that I have typed out on Facebook and then delete, 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 the things that I have wanted to say, I try to, you know, stay off social media because it makes me hate the world. Um, so your answers are beautiful. And in theory, I totally agree with you. But in reality, I have this, I mean, I can feel it now just thinking about it, this hot rage inside of me that makes it very difficult to control my emotions when these topics are, are brought up. So it's hard. Yeah, we appreciate that emotion, Mishana, because a lot of us people call or feel the exact same way. We're tired, we're exhausted, and we're mad. Mm -hmm. Why are we still needing to defend ourselves to right. teach other people what we've been trying to teach for 400 years right it's the same thing all over and over again so it's very refreshing mm -hmm. and i and we appreciate those emotions and you empathizing with us and fighting for us it, it's, it's very important that's why we have that's why we wanted to have this discussion on being black adjacent um, because we know we have family that are black adjacent we have friends that feel the same way and it's emotionally supportive to us. So we, I appreciate it. I appreciate your tears and your frustration. I also wanted to add another reason we want this, we want to give a voice to our family members and Mashana and Paul, sorry, um, who haven't really had a voice and I know they're going through something, but we want to give them a place to talk about what they're going through, to talk about what it means to be connected, but maybe not feel connected sometimes, to have that rage and not know what to do with, give them a voice too. So thank you, Mishana. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Teresa, for bringing that up. Because I'm in the same boat with my husband too, even though he his DNA says he's white, but he looks native and we know it's in there somewhere, but he's just mad. <laughs> himself because he's going through the same things with me and and actually with him, within himself as well um it's hard but we're gonna get through it together <laughs> that's all we know that's all we have these discussions um speaking of the people that we love does being black adjacent make you more conscious or protective of that loved one absolutely yeah you know, um, lot, lots of times I've, I've maybe uh, read something into something that wasn't there, just on the try to err on the side of protecting my wife or my kids uh, in a situation. You know, somebody may have made a, a comment or something that I just that they didn't mean it that way, but I'm I'm on edge. I'm I'm, I'm sort of like I'm sensitive, 
to those those things. So I think, yeah, I'm a lot more protective because of it. I'm going to follow up to that, Paul. What does it consciously, how does that consciously make you feel or uh, the actions that you take? Is there some, in your daily life, is there some conscious thoughts that you have or actions because of your love for Teresa as you walk up the house and just go about your normal life and listen to people and media and all that? Does that make sense? What am I yeah. asking? Okay. Yeah, it, uh, it ranges like uh, Mashana said about, uh, you know, rage to um to hurt you know feeling discouraged i mean you know why questioning what would be in somebody's head that they would try to hurt somebody else for any reason like that you know uh but yeah we were um i remember one time we were in north carolina at a biscuit deal and uh, we were sitting uh, having a, a breakfast and uh, there was a couple of men that were sitting just right next to us and they were being very passive aggressive. It was obvious what they were talking about without saying it. And uh, it just, uh, you know, you know, your reactions can, can vary from being to want to talk to somebody and another one is to punch them in the face or something, you know? Right. So you protect your, your family. So, yeah. Katrina, how about you? Um, of course I'm, <laughs> I'm probably overprotective of my family, but um, my kids are all grown. They're all adults. Um, we've taught them to act a certain way, um, respond a certain way. Um, they have to make those decisions themselves if they're going to follow that or not. Um, I have so many different mixed messages or mixed feelings, I guess, with everything that's going on in the world. I don't agree with all of them. Um, it's heartbreaking um, that we're in 2020 and we still see someone based upon their culture to think that um, somebody outside of the Caucasian culture isn't able to lead a community, lead a country, lead. Um, we may have differences in philosophy, in policy and stuff like that. Um, but to actually think that, man, because they're Asian, Mexican, Hispanic, black, whatever, that they can't hold a position or um, we're putting them down and trying to hold somebody down. I think we're threatened. Um, I think our ideology is threatened. And so if we're threatened, that means I might have been wrong all along and I don't want to face the fact that I was wrong. Um, and that's tough for people to admit, hey, I'm wrong. I seen it this way, but um, so it's a, um, it's a, it's a tough situation. Um, I just, again, I put my faith in God and he's placed me here for a reason. Um, I've got three um, biracial boys. Um, my husband always tells me the world sees them black, Katrina. I know they're biracial, but the world sees them black. And of course I come back with, but I don't care how the world sees them. How does God see them? And they're here for a purpose. And um, I call them my little bridges because I want them to bridge the gap and bring insight into, you know, what they've experienced to both cultures. Um, but it can be um, intimidating um, them being black men out here on the street. And um, I, I guess I don't worry because God tells me not to worry and I put my faith in him. So I think that is the very core of who I am as a person and helps me to deal with this situation at hand. Mashana? Um, I, you know, I think I try to, I try to lead by example because again, I know arguing isn't gonna, it, you can't, you can't change someone like you said earlier, Noel, that doesn't want to change, that doesn't want to see things. But again, it's difficult. Um, 
for me to do that because I have um, I have a tendency to you're just dead to me. You no longer exist in my world, but that doesn't change the world that we live in. And so it's hard, you know, even though I want to completely shut out everything of people that are um, just repulsive to me, that's not go that's not going to make things better. And so I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to work on myself. I'm trying to remember, you know, um, I'm trying to take the plank out of my own eye first and and lead by example, but it's hard. It, that is hard because I want to just, you know. <laughs> I, and if I want, you don't, you become them. Right. So then you just swap mm -hmm. positions. Yeah. yeah. We feel justified, but it's still wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It is wrong. And that's why I reckon I'm trying not to fight wrong with wrong. But again, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was going through, like I said, going through these questions with my husband last night. This is going to sound terrible, but it's like, you know, what do you, you know, how do you respond? What do you do? I'm like, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Just <laughs> get rid of them in any way. But that's not realistic and that's not going to help things. And again, back to my faith, that is not what, you know, my spiritual um, life, that's not what Jesus would call me to do. So, but I also recognize that he recognizes that I'm not perfect and I'm trying to work on me too. <laughs> so since you, you mentioned the next question, Mashana, let me, ref, let me change this next question up. I'll give you all a situation and I'll see how, maybe think about how you would respond to it. And I know we probably have all heard this, so I'm just going to ask it. So how would you respond to people that say, I have a black friend my cousin's black, you know, and honestly think that there's no race, that, they, that, that, that they're not racist. How would, how would you respond to that? And if you need a second, we can go to someone else and come back to you. Me, how do I respond? Yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I said your name, I must not have. <laughs> um, you know, I try, again, I try to have conversations with people. I really try to uh, even things like white privilege. People do not understand. They think white privilege is about money. And I have that, you know, which I think relates to racism, relates to the same kind of thing. Uh, trying to explain to people that white privilege doesn't have anything to do with your socioeconomic status. You are in, um, you're in a, you're recognized in a different way. You do not face the same adversities and you have no idea what it feels like to be in someone else's skin color and just try to go about your daily routine. That is white privilege, but people refuse to recognize it and they don't want to be educated. Um, you know, I try to, again, diversity is something that of course I'm interested in and I teach it in my nursing courses and I have a lot of, you know, um, resources for um, recognizing implicit biases and um, stigma and white privilege. And when I, when I try to, you know, I don't want to try to, I try not to come off like, I think I know everything, but in my experience, my eyes have been open and, and my viewpoints have changed by, you know, going through some of these um, processes and looking at things from a different way. I have a lot of resources I'd be happy to share with you, but you know, it's, that's where I try to go. That's um, the, I will say that the feedback is usually not good. And again, I, you know, people are set in their ways and you have to want to see things differently before you give it a, a give it a chance. And, um, and, you know, I'm pretty stuck in my ways too. I it's hard for me to to empathize with that perspective because I don't understand it at all. I do not understand it. Um, so it's you know these are these are hard questions. It's, it's a hard topic. Very. Katrina, what about you? You know, it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. 
if you don't have an intimate relationship with someone, meaning you've just taken the barriers off and you're able to just um, really um, let your soul be seen. People that say, oh, I've got black friends. Um, I know what they're trying to say, um, but again, it's just surface. Um, I, I can't say that they're racist because they don't have black friends or I mean, they um, not intimate with someone. Maybe they just don't have the opportunity. You know, Ironton's 98% Caucasian, 1% African-American. So how's a lot of white people have the opportunity to really engage unless they really seek it out and have a determination to do that. So um, I think we beat up white people sometimes and we don't need to. Um, again, it's just a matter of you have to be confident in who you are and what you're be what you've been called to do because you're going to have so many issues in life. Um, when I go to Columbus, I feel like I'm discriminated against for being Appalachian. Um, they tease me all the time about my country accent <laughs> and, um, it's very hard for me to get employment up there. And um, you're gonna have racism, genderism, you're gonna have all kinds of isms coming at you. Um, but it's just a matter of who you are. Don't take on what somebody else is doing. Um, you just have to be confident in who you are and what God's called you to be. So um, I just try not to live in that spirit of offense and again, go back to my 24 seven teaching moments and try to use that as an opportunity to make them go a little deeper and get them to understand maybe a different philosophy, a different way of thinking. Paul? Um, I was just thinking that uh, this kind of, this relates to a, a, an activity I had in, in one of my classrooms uh, in the past there's an activity called tabletop Twitter where you put a you put a, you put a provocative statement uh, in the middle of a big uh, sheet of paper and then uh, you have the students uh, react to they, they walk around the room and they react to uh, the, the statement in writing but you don't put your name on it and then other kids respond to the other kids response it's like Twitter but on tabletop and um, I thought that was that was a it, that was just a, when I when I put uh, the topic of um, something similar to what we're talking about, uh, those get the, the best the biggest longest responses, and so you know opening up communication I guess and maybe even if it's if it's in an anonymous way uh, helps people to better understand you know uh, how someone else feels. I wish there was a curriculum for empathy. That we could just teach empathy it would be like math or english or you get credit in empathy in high school uh, but we don't have that but uh, it's you know if, if we could teach people just to be kind and empathize uh, go a long way to solve a lot of these problems so go along with your empathy and oh this kind of leads into the, the next question paul and i'd like you to start it off of how you can overcome, how do you overcome cultural barriers when it comes to your interrelation relationship, your inter, sorry, I'm speaking too quickly and not clearly, your interracial relationship or just with your family interracially, how do you overcome those cultural obstacles? Um, I don't feel like we've ever had a huge issue with that in my life. My, she might feel different. I don't know but we've never really had those situations in our family on either side. I mean, I've always felt like uh, I was welcomed by the overwhelming majority of her family. And I hope she feels that way about my family. And uh, uh, really, we, I don't believe we've had a situation where that was, that I can really speak to, that I can think of. Teresa, you? you you're right. Uh, for the most part, I mean, I have some family members who, I don't socialize with, so I'm okay with them not liking you because they aren't welcome in my house anyways. But uh, for the most part, yeah, no, we tend to, um, 
give each other our, our places, our spaces and, and allow for the differences. Um, like I, I like to tell this story. When we were first dating, I didn't like country music. And uh, Paul did, because he's from Kentucky. Uh, but he grew up listening to country music. So I would say, you can't play that in my car because my car will die in the middle of the road. <laughs> but since I've been here, since I've been with him, I, I learned to appreciate some country music. And I actually listen to it in no words to some of the songs. But we haven't um, tried to make each other something else. I think that's what the trick is. You don't try to make him more black or me more white. We just accepted each other for who we are. Um, and so it kind of works out for us. And I think for our kids too. Maya's on here so she could comment on that if she wants to. But I think it kind of worked out for our family that we didn't try to change each other into the other culture and try to forget one over the other. That's powerful. And I'm sure that was was powerful for your kids as well. I don't know if Maya wants to chime in. I'll give her a second in case she wants to. Yeah, I can just say, I feel like I was really lucky in that I had a really rich experience as both like a black woman and an Appalachian person. So like, I really appreciated going into spaces where I could tell that the cultures were sort of divided or keeping to themselves that I had a point of reference for both. And it did feel kind of like um, what Katrina mentioned earlier, like I was kind of a bridge between those two. And that can be really empowering. It can also be really exhausting. So like, you know, it kind of, biracial people, I think they should always exercise their best judgment when becoming that point or like a bridge. But um, I will say I feel really grateful for the ways that reciprocal cultures were appreciated in my upbringing and how I don't really feel like a dissonance between my identity because of that. I feel like I'm both like very richly. Which is very refreshing to hear. <laughs> so it sounds like Teresa, you and Paul did a great job. <laughs> Um, Mashana, mm -hmm. same question. How would you, or how do you overcome culture, bar culture barriers um, that may exist within interrelation, interracial relationships? Um, I think, uh, again, this is what, trying to be my best self. It's not, I, and I fail daily, hourly. But um, anybody who knows me knows that Michelle Obama is like my idol. I love her. And I love when they go low, we go high. I mean, I come back to that over and over and over again. And I think that's what I try to live by. Um, I, Like I said, I try to have open conversations. But in my experience, that hasn't been very successful because... Um, People don't really want to, they, they don't want to, to broaden their perspective. Um, and I don't know if it's just the political climate that we've been in, but it seems like everybody is just locked into this is it and there's no flexibility and I'm not willing to move on this. Um, so I think, you know, I was thinking about my great, also, you know, I think babies change families also. Um, my great grandmother who loved us more than life itself. Uh, when my sister was um, dating my nephew's father, she said, honey, you know, you're pretty enough for a white boy. And how hurtful that was and how painful that was. And then that black baby came and how she adored that baby. And how even in her late 70s and 80s, you know, it's never too late to change. Her, her perspective changed and how protective she was of him and how much she loved him. Um, so, you know, I think in the right circumstances, in the right experience, things, people can change. Again, it's hard and it's hard for me because my emotions run high. And so I try to walk away when, when it gets to that point. I'm gonna back up your statement about people can change Mashana because my mother's brother 
they were all raised, you know, to don't mix and mm -hmm. all that. So their dad was very racist, but my mother's brother would not talk to her for 30 years because she married a black man. Mm -hmm. But he has since changed his ways. It's been a few years ago, but, and he's the best uncle I could ever ask for that I didn't have growing up, but he changed. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And how big of you to be able to forgive him? and to move forward and to have the love of the uncle. You know, that's hard for me because I said, like I said, I'm my first instinct is to cut people out of my life and I, I don't have a problem doing that. And so that's bad, that's bad <laughs> because then you don't give them the opportunity. Right. You shut down the learning opportunity and you know, the right. experience for, for love that, that when you do that. Right, I wouldn't know him. <laughs> if I didn't give him a chance. So mm -hmm. um, I'm a work in progress myself. So I agree. No, well, we, we do have a question in the chat. Okay. okay. Uh, the question is uh, for our panelists, what role does social media play in breaking down racial barriers? If it you think it does, or does it do the opposite, build barriers? In my opinion, it builds barriers. People have, people can sit behind a computer and lash out their built um, mm -hmm. and not be held accountable for it because they're behind this computer they're not face to face and they feel the freedom of saying just crazy stuff um and on the other side of it again teachable moment sometimes people put stuff out there that people is offended by and they didn't mean it that way and other people thought it was a race racist gesture but they weren't intending it that way so I think social media um, has really built on it rather than break it down. Anyone else? I agree. I agree. I think, you know, I think it's, it's so deceptive also. And it's part, I mean, there's so much, um, there's so much, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but there's so much bot activity out there. Yeah. that is, you know, trying to antagonize and create division and maintain that division. Um, I think that social media had the potential to be a really great tool, but as we progress, it is just, it's very destructive, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Paul? I agree. Um, I used to be a big fan of Facebook until I Noticed that two thirds of my friends were blocked. You know, I wow. block them for something they said or something I didn't agree with or something. You know, and you know, social media would be great for um, if people are open to talking and discussing and you know being real. But uh, uh, just like on Twitter, I block people on Twitter if if, I, if they're an idiot, or if I think they're stupid, and, you know, if they say something I don't like, I, I block them. So. Uh, it could be a great tool, but it uh, you can also, I think, cause damage. You know, it hasn't been a great tool lately, has it? <laughs> and see, I'm the I'm the opposite. Um, I I want to see those feeds um, because, again, if I block them, how can I change their mind? Um, and so, if I see stuff like that, I'm able to, you know, come back with something different. And so, if I'm blocking them, I'm keeping that barrier between us. And never change in that culture. So you know, I think, a minute. Sorry, go ahead, Mashana. Go ahead. I was just going to say another, um, not social media, but one of the barrier, something that is extremely painful to me and is hard for me is, um, you know, the 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 lag from social media to the people I know and the. The circles that I am involved with them in. For instance, the people in my church that are posting hate-filled, disgusting, ignorant things on social media, and then I have to sit in church with them on Sunday morning. And again, you know, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for me to reconcile that, to reconcile. Again, I try to focus more on me and you know, I am far from perfect, and, you know, what my God calls me to do is to look at myself, not to judge other people, but it's really hard when, you know, in your your spiritual community, people are, are so offensive. 
I saw <laughs> Maya's comment or chat in the chat, and she said protecting your peace is important. I think mm -hmm. that's what she said. Teresa, you can correct me if that's what um, if, if I saw that wrong, but that no, kind of goes right. along, along in the lines of what you're saying, Mashana is. How do you protect your peace in that instance? I think Paul made the point of blocking them. So that's how you do protect that peace. So that's a, that was a good point. No, that's exactly why I, uh, just what Maya said is, uh, you know, there's so, so much negativity. I mean, so many, so many things to worry about. And, you know, after a while you just, you know, just get tired of it. So. Yeah. And I totally mm -hmm. agree with that. And I, you know, my only other, you know, I'm sort of crazy and all over the place because I want to just block it and I want to not, you know, deal with it. But on the other hand, I don't want to condone their actions by silence either. And so I've gotten to this point where I'm like, I'm not going to be silent. I'm going, I'm going, but then not trying to do it in a, an open way and not a threatening way and it's just, it's, I'm exhausted. <laughs> it's very difficult, <laughs> needless to say. So we only have a few more minutes. Um, what advice do you all have um, as we move, move forward with our lives and with the state the country's in? Um, how do we make a difference? Anyone can start. I'm not gonna call anyone this time. Just what advice do you have or positive words or direction you know for One me advice I can, hold on. one piece of advice i can absolutely give is like like my father said just block someone if you don't feel like you should involve yourself in that type of situation but if you but if you actually like i like i've actually in recent years actually i've like exposed myself to to that side of that side of the internet and that side of people that, well, I didn't really expose myself by, by learned about them. Mm -hmm. Everything that we know right now about them, is only like surface level. If you go back behind it, it's actually 10 times worse, if I'm gonna be honest. I've, so how would you have people understand it then? How'd I have people understand it? Mm -hmm. The interracial relationships and families. The interracial relationships and families. Actively pursue it. Look that. Get that. Don't, okay. don't shy away from it. If you, because so many people have been looking at this, looking at one side of it because that's all they, they've been shown. With all these different social media companies, with all these different online platforms that, that allow you to search up things, they will actively show you what, what they want to show you at some point. But if you actively break through and tell them, no, I don't want to look at that type of stuff, they will actively stop look, trying okay. to advertise it for you. Okay. Any other I'm sorry, well, I don't know if anybody heard me, but did you say something, Robert? No? Okay. Panelists, anybody want to tackle this one? Um, just to be kind of to, to lighten a little bit, I, I will say that I'm the go to guy in Boyd County for white men who want to date black women. Uh, I've had people I work with, students come to me and say, Look, can you give me some advice? Well, you know, and ask. <laughs> like uh uh what, what, what do you say i mean but you know i think uh there are more good people than there are bad people and i think you know it, it's it was kind of shocking that uh kind of discouraging that you know you thought we'd come so far and then for the past four years to see how many people are still out there that uh, have not been showing you their true self but uh I don't know. I guess you just stay the course, stay positive, and you know. Mashana, Katrina, any thoughts? I um, still go back to love covers a multitude of sin. Um, I can't change someone until they want to change or see a different, you know, a different viewpoint. 
um, and I'm only responsible for Katrina's feelings. And if I assert that and allow you to offend me, shame on me. Um, people have been taught stuff on both sides. I've had racism from both sides, not just white people. And so if I allow that to offend me, then how can I continue to try to bring insight to both areas? So I just, I can't allow myself to live in that spirit of offense and just be confident in who I am and continuing my mission it's difficult. It's exhausting. I heard somebody say it earlier. It's exhausting. Um, but guys, this is this is reality. There's there's racism. There's genderism. There's all these isms that we have out here. Um, again, I can't change somebody's viewpoint. Maybe they can change through my actions. Maybe they can change through the way I treat them. Um, I just have to continue operating in love. Absolutely. Michelle, any, any closing remarks? I, I, I mean, I think the same, just try to be the light, try to be the example, try to, try to through your actions, not through your words necessarily, you know, so be a better example. Um, well said <laughs> short and sweet well said <laughs> so on behalf of our council on diversity and inclusion i'd like to thank each and every one of you for attending especially our panelists um for giving providing your experiences and your feedback and um your input is valuable for to us on, on our council and we'll take it back and hopefully with our, fu our future series. Um, I know Robert mentioned in a previous, um, I think the, the very first series that a social media one would be great is a good idea. So, um, but yeah, we really, we really appreciate your attendance and all your feedback and hopefully you'll be a part of our future series. So um, with that, and anyone else has anything else to say? We're done. <laughs> right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.